Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this research conversation webinar on climate change and environmental pressures in Vietnam. Before we start, uh, let me just give you a few technical indications. You have two tabs on your right, a chat for comments and a question tab for questions. So please feel free to comment or ask questions all along the presentation. So um, for the schedule, the general presentation will last about one hour and then we will have about half an hour for questions. So let me share my screen to start. So as an introduction, I would like to give a few elements on the general context of the work presented today. So uh, a reminder, uh, maybe for people who uh, doesn't know this project on the GEM Vietnam project. So the GEM Vietnam research program was launched in uh, 2019. Uh, it's an ambitious program which had the general objective to support Vietnam in the implementation of the Paris Agreement with regard to impacts and adaptation. It was implemented in collaboration with the Department of Climate Change of the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment, also in collaboration with IRD and also IMHEN. The project involved more than 60 researchers and experts from Vietnam, France and other countries. Last year, on the occasion of COP26, a first report called Climate Change in Vietnam, Impacts and Adaptation was released. This year, on the occasion of COP27, two other and final reports were released, building on the findings of the previous one. So a national report uh, still on climate change impacts and adaptation in Vietnam and a special report on the Mekong Delta emergency. Um, so before we move on to the uh, presentation of the content of this report, I would like to leave the floor to Hervé Conan, uh, who is the director of the IFD agency in Hanoi. Uh, Hervé, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie Noël, and sorry because uh, um, it was scheduled that uh, I will conclude the webinar, but uh, I have a flight schedule conflict, and I will give you a few words to introduce the webinar from Ho Chi Minh City Airport, so maybe you will have some uh, some noise. I was still in Camao this morning, a province south of the Mekong Delta that has been hit hard by coastal erosion and must develop solution to rethink its economic activity and support it. The impact of climate change in Vietnam, as you know, are not just words. It is a daily reality experienced by the inhabitants, flooding, typhoons, coastal erosion, saline intrusion. Therefore, Vietnam must now define very proactive policy and strategy to respond to the many transitions it will have to face. To do this uh, political, to do this political leaders, sorry, sorry, because, oops, to do this political leaders, researchers, economic actors and civil society must be able to rely on sound scientific data and possible solution recommendation. This is what the work done under GEM allows us to propose conduct between French and European researchers in close contact with Vietnamese teams. The results are taken seriously by by Monday, the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment. We must therefore continue the dialogue with the national and local authorities in connection with all projects in the provinces in order to develop pilot projects implementing the relevant recommendations presented in the GEM reports. I would therefore like to thank all the researchers and experts who have participated in the GEM journey since 2019, in particular the teams of the IRD, the DCC and IMEN in Vietnam, and of course, the marvelous team of the IFD Research Department. Beyond the result of the work produced by GEM, which are an important basis for the IFD country office to engage a public policy dialogue, this work has also made it possible to establish relations of trust that are fundamental when we want to support a country in this various transition issue. This is why we will continue this fruitful scientific collaboration in the framework of future projects in particular to enhance the macroeconomic GEM model on the impact of the different energy transition strategies that Vietnam can implement in connection with its net zero emission commitment in 2050 and the associate social impact. We would like also work on the physical impact of climate change. This is what we agreed with Monre in the framework of the MOU signed with Minister Monre at COP27 in Chaman Chai. So thank you again for your involvement and interest in the work of GEM a fundamental tool to support a public policy dialogue with the Vietnamese government. I, I wish you to all 
uh, a good webinar and uh, and i hope to to have the the conclusion we have with uh, landing in uh, in hanoi in two hours thank you and have a good webinar bye bye thank you very much harvey um, so, to continue, so the, the two reports uh, released this year tackle quite a large number of different topics and issues. So, the objective of the webinar today is to give you a broad overview of the content of these two reports. And we will organize next year a series of webinars to present uh, the contents of each chapter in more detail. So, we will start with the presentation of the three chapters of the national report and then we will move on to the Mekong report. So, without any further delay, uh, I now leave the floor to Ngo Duktan from the University of Science and Technology of Hanoi to present the first chapter of the national report on climate projections. Tan, the floor is yours. Good morning and good uh, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. So, um, so um, um, uh, actually, I would like to introduce you about the first part of, uh, uh, you know, of the report. So the, the first part, next slide please, um, uh, you know, we, this one is, has been done to, in collaboration with uh, Chen Anh Kuan and HNS Punch, and we are focusing on downscaling, that is downscaling for CMIP5 and CMIP6 uh, uh, global climate outputs. Uh, so we know that global climate models, they will have cost resolutions and they are not appropriate for regional and local impact studies. So that's why we need to uh, downscale. And in the previous COPE 26 report, we have downscale already 31 significant GCM to 10 kilometer resolutions for Vietnam. And in this national report, we are going to downscale again 35 uh, CMIP 6 global climate models to 10 kilometer resolutions with the latest uh, scenarios at SP, and for the four variables, uh, rainfall, uh, daily average, daily maximum, and daily minimum temperatures for the period, uh, historical one and the future until 2100. And the data, the downscale data are freely available at the website uh, indicated in the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Begin uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. Um, um, okay, and then uh, here you can see that this is one illustration of uh, uh, the reasons we have uh, for the projections of future temperatures over global uh, size on the on your left hand side and over Vietnam on your right hand side. So we can see the different, uh, uh, slightly difference in semip six and semip five results, as well as the degree of uncertainties that we can obtain here. Uh, with the output of the multi downscale products. Uh, next slide, please. And a very important part of uh, our study is that we could be able to successfully implement the probabilistic projections for the future climate of Vietnam. Uh, the motivation of this is that the above downscaling products we have built they are still based on a limited number of models and they were not met for either capturing the full uh, uh, prob probability distributions. Then uh, normally, uh, if we use uh, this output from the multi-models, we still underestimate the likelihood of extreme climate impacts. Uh, moreover, uh, a previous study already also showed that global climate models, they often underestimate extreme so to overcome these issues so we have built in uh, this report a surrogate model mix ensemble and we call it mme method so the uh, steps we use to develop the the lsme products you know is illustrated in in the figure next slide please and also we show here is an illustration of the results with probabilistic projections we highlight every seasonal temperature anomaly uh, in the future compared to the historical period under the LSP 5.5 uh, scenarios. And you can see the properties of uh, uh, temperatures increase in the future. And uh, the LS SMME data also are freely available uh, in our servers at the following address uh, indicated in the slide. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this essentially has a, a results we obtain uh, for the climate part and we recompense the potential use of the daily and high resolutions uh, data we produce. Uh, they are all freely available because the data size is very large. And uh, uh, when using uh, those uh, climate change scenarios, uh, also we would highlight the uncertainty range of, uh, you know, that we should take into account. And this study also opens a new opportunity in the future, the new future directions that we can consider for the next phase or for next studies is that to build a better observation data set because with a better observation data set we can build a better future climate and then uh, it's also highly recommend that the large scaling process we develop also can be applied for other variables uh, uh, for the use uh, you know um, of other impact uh, uh, studies thank you very much that's uh, the information i would like to share with you about the climate part we developed Thank you very much, Dan. So uh, now I will uh, leave the floor to my colleague Guillermo Magacho uh, to present the second chapter of the national report on Vietnam's green industrial path between carbon and climate exposures. Guillermo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie Noël. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Well, basically, the uh, the idea of this part of the report is to assume a more sectoral analysis where we're looking more specifically to both the, the industries that will be impacted by the transition, for example, fossil fuels may reduce the demand for fossil uh, There will be a reduction in demand for fossil fuels and also the industries that will be impacted by climate change. Uh, for example, agriculture production will be uh, negatively impacted in some countries and positive impacts in others. So this, the idea is to analyze a little bit on this, uh, based, of course, in public some public policies that may be adopted, either for uh, replacing these fossil fuels or other sunset industries, for example, uh, technologies on cement, and also in adaptation. Well, and we analyze this from three dimensions that we consider as extremely important for developing countries. First, the raise of foreign currents. It is important to, to because, of course, like there will be a, the need for import a lot of inputs and uh, capital goods. Then there is the need for a guarantee, no balance of payment imbalances. Also, we look at the fiscal imbalance that may emerge because, of course, some industries are very important, in, especially in countries that depend on these industries uh, to guarantee the fiscal revenues necessary to do all the investment necessary for the transition and also we look at the impact on social economic impact employment and wages to understand these dynamics next slide please well in the case of uh, the sunset industries which are the industries that will be replaced basically or the technologies that will be replaced we look at the dependence in these four dimensions that we're talking but I'm presenting here the in the vertical axis the dependence on the country's dependence in terms of employment and in the horizontal axis in terms of wages. And as you can see, Vietnam is very dependent on these industries. The dashed line is the the 20% the top 20% more exposed countries. So Vietnam is very, very dependent on these industries to pay wages. Why? because these industries we consider the direct and indirect impact using input to analysis but these industries are the ones that pay the best uh, they, they generate the, the jobs that pay the most uh, the higher waste wages so as you can see despite not being very important in terms of employment generation these industries this uh, fossil fuel cement uh, steel uh, aluminium some industries that will or either they will have like this technological change that will need to replace the way they are producing or there will be a drop in demand itself. They are very dependent to, uh, to pay wages in the case of uh, Vietnam. Next slide, please. Well, when you look at the uh, climate impacts, we see that here in the horizontal axis we have tax revenues, the importance of tax revenues, and the vertical axis we have the importance of our net foreign currency generation. So basically, avoid imbalance of payment. 
And when you're talking about climate impacts, Vietnam, of course, is not and uh, you cannot compare Vietnam with small islands that will be very impacted because uh, we have floats and everything. But it's it is among the most impacted countries. It is among the most impacted countries, both in terms of the importance of these industries to basically exports. Right? Uh, they are very important in the export baskets of Vietnam, and also in terms of tax revenues. Next slide, please. Uh, well, but there is some good news, of course. <laughs> the, these that were presenting, they were very high exposure of Vietnam, both to the transition itself, like dependence on the sunset industries and uh, climate impact, can be compensated by this. The Vietnam is among the countries with the highest global, uh, green complexity potential. What does it mean? It means that they are they have the capabilities to produce green industrial products so they can put forward an industrialization process as you can see of course like you have china in the top but you have uh, indonesia and malaysia vietnam thailand among the most uh, competitive sorry uh, uh, among the most competitive uh, countries the countries that has the highest green complex potential so despite being very exposed in Vietnam is a country that can not easily, but if put forward some industrial policies and some measures that uh, stimulate these green industries, they can uh, replace the these uh, sunset industries and the industries that will be impacted by climate change for green industries. So basically, this is what we we discuss in this chapter and try to based on these understand. Uh, the industrial path that Vietnam can follow to overcome this complexity, this uh, this complex impacts in the, during the transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, now to um, uh, so the last chapter of the national report was on integrated prospective assessment of climate impacts, adaptation strategies, and net zero strategy. And here I leave the floor to Nguyen Tituha from University of Rouen uh, in Normandy in France. Uh, Tuha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie <clears throat> So uh, as you can see, we have a climate data projection for Vietnam from the part one. And we see in the part two of this report, Vietnam belongs to the most exposed country um, to climate impacts. And uh, given the context of globalization and fashion, financial stylization of Vietnam, it is essential to have a comprehensive uh, macroeconomic framework to assess the impact of climate change in Vietnam. Uh, so that's why um, our main idea in this um, part three of the report is to develop an integrated economic-wide assessment um, to analyze the economic impact of climate change and adaptation measure. Uh, concretely, um, we try to assess the economic impact of climate change in Vietnam via uh, a combination of a um, multiple climate scenario, um, damage function, and then integration within a macroeconomic stock flow consistent model. And the stock flow consistent model allows to integrate all the flow and the stock in the economy, the interaction between the real and the financial sectors. And um, as you know, nowadays, the financial sector is very important for the economy. The impact of climate change is not only um, on the real side of the economy, but also on the financial side. Uh, for example, the negative effect of uh, climate change on the business activity can affect the financial needs uh, of the sectors. Uh, adaptation to climate change will also raise the financing needs for the economy. So uh, in this uh, report, we integrate uh, also the adaptation equation compared to the COP26 report of the project. And uh, we suppose that the adaptation investment decision of uh, each sector in the economy will depend on two things. So the effectiveness and the opportunity cost of the investment. And the effectiveness um, of the adaptation investment will depend on the level of total adaptation capital and the level of climate change. This means that the higher temperature change, uh, the more difficult to adapt. Next slide, please. So there are two main results from the integration of climate uh, damage function and adaptation function into the macroeconomic model. So the first result is the macroeconomic impacts of with and without adaptations, as you can see in this graph. 
So uh, with adaptation uh, investment, the loss will be smaller. It could, uh, so the loss will, could be reduced relative to the scenario with the adaptation. And adaptation investment seems to be effective when the change in temperature remains below a certain threshold. So the, the greater the global warming is, the more difficult adaptation would be. And in both cases, with or without adaptation, the impact will be higher in higher emission scenario. So mitigation effort will contribute to stabilizing the global temperature, and then adaptation would become not too expensive. Next slide, please. And the second main result uh, is related to the financing needs of different sectors in the economy. Adaptation to climate change will raise the question about the financing needs of the extra sector in the, in, the, in the economy. And this figure shows that the increase in the public adaptation investment imply higher public debt, especially when we, the temperature is higher, it will reduce the level of efficiency of the adaptation investment. Therefore, public debt will strongly increase. So the adaptation decision must take into account the budget constraint to obtain more efficient adaptation option and different option of financing uh, by domestic or external debt can also affect the macro financial variable, such as the extreme red the, or the current account of the Vietnam or the manage, uh, management of international reserve of the central bank. So thank you. Thank you very much to her. Uh, so now let's move on to the uh, Mekong Delta Emergency Report. So this report builds, um, basically builds on the main findings of the previous COP26 report regarding the assessment of climate change and environmental pressures in Vietnam. But this new report focuses much more on adaptation strategies. Um, it is composed of three main parts. The first part on um, uh, an assessment um, on to what extent current adaptation and development strategies in the Mekong Delta are or are not consistent with the understanding of uh, the, the environmental and climatic pressures. A second part uh, on adaptation options, which is composed of seven small focuses on different environmental issues and adaptation strategies. And finally, a third part uh, presents results of a modeling exercise with the Lucas GEM uh, model. So we will start, of course, with part one. So now I leave the floor to Huang Vo from Wageningen University and Vietnam National University of Ho Chi Minh City to present this uh, chapter on adaptation strategies. Uh, Huang, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Marino for the introduction. So I would like to uh, talk about the part one of COP27 report. Uh, here in the introduction, uh, we mostly summarize the information provided in the COP26 report, Jim Vietnam. Uh, here we talk about some uh, environmental and climatic pressures to the Mekong Delta in the past three years and also the projections for the future changes. Uh, we talk about like raw water extraction that have, uh, incre have uh, tremendously increased over the past three years and that drive to the high level of land subsidence uh, in together with climate change that in due sea level rise could make uh, a large part of the Mekong Delta uh, about 50 percent fall below sea level in within this century uh, and also some uh, human activities for example upstream dams construction development and sand mining trigger the high erosion rate for the riverbed uh, that also will lead to the increase in saline water intrusion especially in the transitions uh, up to uh, the future in uh, 2050 um, uh, is make most of the part of the Mekong Delta will uh, get infected by saline intrusions up to uh, 40 percent, including some provinces that right now uh, might not have been affected by saline intrusion, but will be in the future. For example, Vinh Long or Ting Yang. And next slide, please. So in, in uh, dealing with this fact, the Vietnamese government in together with some in, international uh, partners have uh, developed some plans, uh, uh, strategies to deal with it. And we wanted to know if uh, those plants and the scientific knowledge are consistent uh, if those plants are evenly referenced by those uh, findings from, from scientific uh, publications and things. So we selected uh, 
19 documents, including official and unofficial plans and strategies uh, to make the overview uh, with the current uh, strategic orientation of the, the uh, Vietnamese Delta development. Uh, in order to do that, we perform uh, keyword analysis and later on hotspot analysis. Here we distinguish two type of criteria. We get text portions that we will assess the present or future uh, climatic and environmental issues and also the tech uh, portions dealing with adaptation or mitigation actions. Uh, so I want to talk about some main findings. Next, please. Here uh, on the right hand side, you can see in the table, uh, most of the um, variables related to environmental uh, and climatic pressures were found mostly in the two latest Mekong Delta plants, the one in 2013 and the newer uh, approved, uh, recently approved Mekong Delta plant. Um, and uh, mostly we don't found it, we don't find it in uh, official plants, uh, mostly zero. Uh, mentioned, for example, the variable of clim climate change, salinity, subsidence, or groundwater. So we conclude that it is difficult to assess the consistency between plants and current scientific knowledge. For me personally, I think is also uh, one of the reasons are the um, uh, uh, the principle to to compose or making a uh, strategy and plan using some report, but it's left behind as the the scene and we could not access, so it's uh, mostly difficult for us. Uh, and we found that uh, environmental problems that are uh, well mentioned in the text portions uh, are the one who uh, which have the immediate and impressive impact on livelihood or on the the, the uh, life of local people. Uh, installed instead of the long term, and that is not uh, visible yet. Uh, so, in uh, order to go further, uh, for okay, we can you go to the next slide, slide, please. So, we go further with the hotspot analysis. We selected five provinces um, based on the uh, scientific knowledge, the findings from mostly from our colleague uh, in the COP26 report. Uh, with relative to sea level rise and saline water intrusion. So you can see in the map five hotspot, including, uh, sorry about that, I cannot see. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this in detail later. Can you move to the next slide? I want to come up with some main conclusions. First of all, the most attention is put on the issues related to uh, water salinization, floods and inundation that are uh, spreadly having impact on local people uh, and livelihood. In contrast, the existential threat of relative sea level rise is much less addressed and not sufficiently um, put into account as it should be. And the plans uh, that address the most non pressures that are the one as have been mentioned uh, above that have the immediate and impressive impact on people and livelihood in the Mekong Delta. And those plans may omit the other newer threats for samples and mining or heat. And then one uh, last but, but uh, non, not less important finding is we found it difficult uh, and the risk for continuing with pushing the development, development because most of the priorities is put uh, on the short-term economic gain instead of for long-term uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, plan uh, address, uh, addressing environmental issues. So because of time limit, uh, I would like to skip the recommendation part. Then we can have it uh, in the detail in the come the near future for a very detailed uh, discussion on the content of the chapter. Okay, thank you so much. Th thank you very much, Wong. So now we move on to the second part and the different uh, the different focuses, and we will first start with one of the uh, one of the major problem of the Delta, which is the uh, issue of the sand budget. And here I give leave the floor to Marc Guachot from WWF. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie Noël. And on behalf of the five co authors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Delta actually is a huge floodplain. 
uh, that was created by the deposition of sediment by the river in a home remodeled by the sea forcing agents. But when you look at uh, an image in a dry season, really what the main thing you see is, is mud, fine sediment. But if you look carefully, next slide please, you can find sand in very strategic areas. In the bottom of the riverbed, in the channels, at the mouth of the channels, where the channels meet the sea, and, and on the coast. And here, the sand plays a vital role to protect the mud formation behind. It plays a role as an armor. And if you look at the picture to the left, it's taken on the coast of Kamau. And if you look at the low, sea, low, low flood, most of the time not visible, you can see a sandbar above, uh, offshore. This sandbar plays a key role uh, in uh, buffering the energy from the uh, sea and protecting the mangrove behind. So that's the important role uh, of sand. Next slide, please. Until uh, very recently, those processes were not well understood and not well documented. In the past years, mainly in the past three years, there's been many groundbreaking uh, research published in, in uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, scientific papers that are very reputable. For now, uh, the science is very solid on the role of uh, sand mining on climate resilience. And there's a very strong consensus among scientists that the key impact of sand mining is riverbed incision. Next slide, please. And what uh, riverbed incision does uh, if you look at this uh, image, uh, which is the Mekong Delta, Cambodia, you see the Tunle Sap. So in Cambodia and in, in, in Vietnam, the, 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 the Mekong system in Cambodia and Vietnam. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the cumulative impact, if you have riverbed incision, then you have delayed and, and less inundation in the floodplain. This affects groundwater recharge. It affects uh, also the movement of water from the river to the Tonle Sap Lake, which affects uh, flood productivity. And, and less buffering of floods mean higher and more intense floods in the Mekong Delta where more people are exposed. It also increases uh, riverbank erosion. It plays a role in uh, changing the uh, conveyance between the main channels of the, of the Mekong. It increases uh, salt intrusion. It increases uh, coastal erosion. So altogether, key significant impacts that uh, cause an existential threat to the Delta and its people. Next slide, please. So sand uh, is key to maintain coastlines uh, and the morphological stability of the estuaries of the Mekong. It has a key role in flood patterns and preventing salt from intruding further into land. So keeping more sand into the river channels may be the most cost effective strategy we have for climate resilience. Yet the demand from aggregate is going to increase because uh, uh, it's needed, sand is needed to support economic growth, to meet uh, rising demands for infrastructure and for urbanization. So as the water and the climate risk become key limiting factors for socioeconomic development, sand needs to be considered as, uh, from the perspective of its trade-off between agricultural productivity, urbanization, and energy. So it makes sand a very strategic resource. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, the report uh, focuses uh, on recommendations. Those were, you, those were based on a report that was produced by UNEP, uh, 22 authors, I was one of the authors. Uh, this report and those recommendations were endorsed by the UN, United Nations uh, Environmental uh, Assembly in uh, March 2020. Two. Uh, so the focus chapter uses those recommendations but adapts them to the specificities of Vietnam and the Mekong uh, Delta and provides very clear recommendations to policymakers, public sector, private sector, civil society. Uh, everybody has a role to play. Uh, the good news is if we take action soon, we can make a difference and, and, and still act and, and, and have a solid impact uh, on uh, the uh, stability uh, and, and the resilience of the Delta. There's also specific work that has been done here. Vietnam is going to produce 
uh, in March, the first ever Delta wide sand budget, which is a key tool for decision making and, and, and groundbreaking uh, achievement uh, for the government of Vietnam that was done in the frame of a project financed by the German government. Uh, so it is not too late. We have to act now. Uh, I invite you to look into the chapter and to take part into the next session when we go to look at those recommendations in more detail. In the meantime, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so as uh, as you have uh, said, uh, uh, sand sediment starvation and especially sand mining are an issue also for coastal erosion, which also has to do with the state of the mangrove system. And here I leave the floor to Nicola Gracio uh, from uh, the, um, sorry, I don't remember the acronym of your lab. Nicola, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, the name is a French speaking name, Centre Asiatique de Recherche Solo, Care Laboratories, where we've been working and this uh, laboratory has been developed 10 years ago. Uh, and we have a long-term collaboration uh, with long-term instay of IRD partners and other research partners in uh, Bakoa University or Ho Chi Minh University of Technology. Next slide, please. So what will be um, read in this focus? This focus is somehow an updated literature review of mangrove-related studies in the Mekong Delta. And it tried to point out the most advanced and recent results. As I said, it's, it corresponds to a long-term collaboration we've got now with uh, Ho Chi Minh University of Technology. Next. And it's also a guideline with five main policy recommendations that are put here on the right hand. I will uh, go briefly on these different recommendations to give you some ideas of what can be understand about mangrove against coastal erosion activities. Next slide, please. So if we look to the recent work of Dune and Minderud, here you have the global functioning and, and the threats of the Mekong Delta. Um, obviously, there is a, a large impact of uh, extraction-induced subsidence, but also the negative effect of sea level rise and of natural compaction of mud in the Mekong Delta. In the other hand, to counterbalance somehow these effects, we have the suspended sediments that uh, give some sediments to the Delta. And another interesting uh, part could be the one corresponding to rice culture and other cultures, so-called organic accumulation. But another activities next would be to restore the oceanic sedimentation. Next slide, yes. So you, uh, in the work presented and provided by Marches Hill et al. in 2019, we can see that, that there is a large amount of fine sediment that is moving all along the coast of the Mekong Delta, uh, from the estuaries to the Kamau region. And the idea will be to reinforce, uh, reboost the oceanic sedimentation. How can we do this? We can do it by first using hybrid solutions to uh, restore sediment flux to the shore and also to restore uh, hundreds to kilometers of mangrove in the cross shore direction. Next slide, please. Uh, here on the left hand, you have some pictures of this kind of hybrid solutions that were developed along the Camaro system. And uh, just uh, below, you have a publication provided by Varzizak et al. in 2022, where you can see that on the left hand, the sediment accretion rate can rise up to tens of centimeters per year when you use hybrid solution in mangrove system. And finally, with a cost that is almost the smallest you can get, just a, a bit higher than the one with mangrove. So clearly, um, hybrid solution, hybrid solution should be promoted to go through a restoration of the oceanic sedimentation to the shore. Once you have uh, sediments, the second step is to get uh, an LC mangrove belt. Next slide, please. And what we can see is that it's not only a question of coastal region, but what is rather new is that there are some, some economic and social opportunities. In a, in a single world, we have to leave the aquaculture-induced erosion model. I will present it very slightly. Next slide. Some years ago, 
uh, Vizen Biketal showed that basically the model of development was not a, a resilience. It consists in uh, creating agriculture pawns, which is a step two during which you have a biggest income of money, but uh, really uh, close uh, later after you have the beginning of a long term coastal erosion because your mangrove system is no more resilient and can no more protect the coast. And finally, your income is decreasing and safety and resources are decreasing. But this is not fatalities and we can change this model. Next slide, please. Basically, the idea from the most recent publication would be uh, first to uh, go to a landward mangrove expansion. This can be done into abandoned aquaculture ponds on the end, but this can also be done with a win-win effect for both coastal region and aquaculture activities by putting some mangrove uh, coverage in the existing and inactivity farms. This was the main publication and main result provided by Le et al. this year, some months ago. Uh, the best um, efficient system was the one where you've got like 30 to 50% of mangrove within your aquaculture ponds. Next slide, please. Watch at the end. <laughs> okay, so that's finished. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, so we're running uh, a bit late on the schedule. Uh, to stay with the issue of sediment starvation, we now move on to the role of retention basins uh, against salt intrusion in the Delta. And I leave the floor to Seper Eslami from Delta Rest. Seper, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mario Noel. Morning and afternoon uh, to all the participants. Um, so as colleagues previously mentioned, salt intrusion is an issue in the Mekong Delta and it's key to land use, to defining the land use in the Mekong Delta. And over the past two decades, we've seen various reports of extreme events and increase in salt intrusion. Next slide, please. Um, in, for the COP26 report of AFD, as Manuel mentioned, we did a systemic study of the uh, Mekong Delta as it relates to salt intrusion. Next slide, please. And uh, there we um, specified and disintegrated all the drivers of change in the Delta from sea level rise to changes in tide, uh, land subsidence, riverbed erosion, and the changes in, in sand mining and changes in uh, fluvial um, discharge and sediment uh, to the Delta. Um, and studying all of those changes, uh, next slide, please. Um, we showed that um, within the next three decades, something between 100 to 800,000 hectares of land in the Mekong Delta will be affected by um, increased uh, salt intrusion, as also previously uh, discussed. In this context, uh, there, there is no single solution for adaptation mitigation, uh, but one of the important topics that's been uh, floating around has been, I've, I've, we've seen many examples of mentioning it as sort of a solution is using retention basins or reservoirs uh, to, to store water in the wet season for the, to, for the dry season to push back sediment. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide. <laughs> Um, uh, to, 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 to look at that, uh, we had to look at the, the system. Uh, I have uh, highlighted uh, the Mekong River Basin and the red uh, box is uh, showing the Tonlesop Lake. Um, so basically we have a system that the Mekong River and, Tonle, and the Tonlesop River meet in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and then we have the division of the rivers that go to the to the delta and, and on the sub discharge the data has been in decline for the last three decades in Kratia discharge, uh, sorry, uh, the Mekong River discharge has been in, uh, in the rise. And therefore we have seen longer saline periods, um, uh, not only because of that, but we've seen longer saline periods in the last uh, two, three decades. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so we uh, have uh, used, um, uh, storage of water uh, in in some uh, comprehensive uh, modeling studies, and we've come to the conclusion that yes, water retention can be effective, but that should be in huge uh, amounts of water. So we're talking about 10 to 20 billion cubic meter of water that has to be used during the dry season of two to three months. Uh, next slide, please. 
that can be effective in reducing uh, increased salt intrusion up to 13%. Now, like I said, cannot be one solution. But uh, what does it mean? Um, that amount of water, if you want to, you have, we have two sources of storage in the lower um, uh, river basin um, in Cambodia and uh, Vietnam. It's either we have to use it um, uh, uh, storage within the delta, that basically means 10 to 25% of the delta has to be storing water. Uh, or we can use the Tonga Sub Lake uh, for uh, freshwater storage. Next slide, please. That's basically telling that this is no single uh, and easy solution. Uh, storage in the Mekong Delta to push back salinity is basically financially probably uh, not uh, justified, except if it's for um, uh, agriculture uh, water, for use of agriculture water. And if it's in the Tonle Sap Lake, it's, it's a very complicated environmental um, uh, operation that basically means we are nowhere close to fine-tuning uh, fine that solution, but we, uh, given the effectivity of this solution, it perhaps needs significant extra research. And it's not a solution that we can just float around as an easy uh, adaptation or mitigation uh, measure. It needs um, very in-depth uh, environmental and economic uh, studies uh, to address. Uh, thank you very much, and please read, read the report that uh, addresses the complexities of this solution. Thank you very much, Sipper. So now we move on to the other and um, probably major issue of the Delta, which is land subsidence uh, triggered by groundwater extractions. Um, and this chapter investigated ways uh, how uh, uh, there could be a reduction in groundwater exploitation uh, to fight land subsidence. And here I leave the floor to Kwon Kai Ha from Ho Chi Minh University of Technology. Kai, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for introducing the focus at the major problem, environmental issue. Yeah, uh, in, in the, the focus, we, we try to understand uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the land subsidence in the Mekong Delta and also uh, how the people, how the policy in the, in the air, uh, in the country to, to uh, reduce the groundwater extraction. At first, uh, other um, researcher already mentioned about the reason of the land subsidence in the Mekong Delta is uh, it, it come from various uh, causes including the natural compaction because of the sediment uh, sorry in the in the area is vulnerable to, to the land subsidence uh, system and also um, they also mentioned about the sand mining or they also mentioned about the land use chain it uh, the cause of land subsidence and groundwater also is the cause, uh, the major, at the defined the major cause of land subsidence in the areas. Please, next slide. Let's, yeah, uh, at the, the model of uh, Minderhau, he, he found out that uh, uh, if uh, the, the, the area continued to, to attract the groundwater and at the, at the current uh, scenarios or increase a bit uh, for, for adapt or cope with the groundwater extraction demand, then the land subsidence will be, uh, the land in the, the Mekong in, uh, area will be uh, flooded by the sea water now. It's in 20, 2020 or even 2000, um, at the end of this century. So this very serious, uh, this is a very serious environmental issue in the area. And the, the country, the, the government also worry about it less amply. Uh, the government, our government, also worry about the, the, the land subsidence. So a lot of, a lot of policy change, a lot of uh, the document issue or decree or, or decision provide to to try to to mitigate to reduce the groundwater extraction or to try to manage the groundwater extraction effectively. And you can see here, uh, for example, in 2008 uh, and eight, we we provide a decision that the Monrea. Uh, provide a decision of the groundwater uh, for for restrict or prohibit groundwater extraction in the some in the land subsidence area but um, they they also fight face with very difficulty in in in, in uh, pro prohibited uh, groundwater extraction and that's some uh, that's why in 2018 they have to modify the the decree to and um, they, they provide the, the decree of 167 to restrict the groundwater um, restriction of 
uh, groundwater exploitation in the in the land subsidence area and based on the degree they try to uh, to set some criteria for groundwater extraction but uh, the, the next slide please was based on uh, on the data of groundwater extraction in the uh, Mekong data and you can see in the figure here even though a lot of the, the document is provided and uh, the, the degree is provided groundwater, uh, groundwater extraction is continuously increasing a lot in the Mekong data since, uh, since 19, to 1990 up to 2015 Currently, we have a lot. Um, we have uh, almost two million, more than two million cubic meter per day extracted from the aquifer system. As uh, as you can see uh, in the figure from a previous study, they already found out that uh, because of surface water is the saline, and um, the rain only occur during the rainy season. That's why the farmer uh, in the Mekong Delta they have no choice but to use groundwater. So that's why that's why when when we when we try to reduce the groundwater extraction, it's not possible because they have a, don't, they don't have alternative fresh water for their using. That's what is one problem. Another thing is that some people, actually not some, and many people in, in the country, they, they do not quite believe on the, the modeling of, of land subsidy because of, of the, we, we have a very limited of the monitoring data and and uh, and the, the the geological data that's why they still worry the, the uncertainty of ten subsidence so that's why and another thing for for groundwater management uh, as uh, you may know that's uh, we we have uh, some kind of um, the management uh, procedure is that does mean that monrea can manage groundwater very big well uh, it's more than three thousand cubic meter per day but for the industrial well we call but for this uh, province, they, they can manage the, the well with the smaller um, net than 3,000. And for the net than 10 cubic meter per day, it's exempted from the document. That's why uh, the, the people, no co-authority, they can not easy to manage groundwater in the, in the area. And also they don't have a lot of the people for managed groundwater extraction. It's also uh, um, induce some, some problem of the the groundwater management in in the in the uh, the Mekong Delta. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so based on the our study, we provide some kind of recommendation for the the area. First, we we, we recommend the area to improve the, their monitoring network and data collection at the same time. The secondly, we we try they need to improve the institute personal setup and improve the collaboration with across the scale and sector it means that because we, we manage the groundwater based on the province also so if the province because the groundwater is not the kind of the admin, administration border so uh, for the one province only uh, from cannot cannot manage groundwater by itself and the uh, they also need to think about the alternative fresh water source, as I mentioned uh, previously, because the people in the area, they don't have a fresh water uh, without groundwater. So that's why if we want to, uh, to, to reduce groundwater extraction in the area, we need to provide some kind of fresh water, alternative water for them. So, we, so how can they do this? We, we suggest that they can save groundwater yield by conjunctive view. Sometimes it can yield conjunctive view here, it, it, you can you conjunct with the surface water or even in rainy water uh, in the rainfall in the rainy season they can collect the rain water and store in the ap for system for 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 safer for for the right season or they can improve the policy of groundwater management is uh, for example in uh, we, we learned from the bangkok uh, area from the chapaya River basin. They also provide some kind of tariff for for reducing water there, uh, for the groundwater extraction, for minimizing the land subsidence in the in the area. So we, so so the the area also the Mekong Delta also need to learn about that kind of thing, and increase the management capacity is uh, and also the capacity of the people, the local authority, and awareness of people. We we cannot manage groundwater or we cannot manage water without without the, the local people 
because they are using the water. So it, it so that's why the awareness of people, local people is very important. So this is our recommendation for the, the, the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, so let's move on uh, because we're running out of time to a slightly different topic, although it's related, of course, to uh, both um, uh, to, to, to the previous ones, which is agriculture. And here I leave the floor to Trilo Toan from the CESBIO in France. Tri, the floor is yours. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Trilo Toan and I present the on the impact of uh, climate and human activities on the rice cultivation. And uh, the, this the report summarizes uh, what we learned during the last uh, few years. Next, please. Well, uh, my my co-authors are in France and in Vietnam. And the, the context the, that they, over the last decades, uh, rice cultivation in Vietnam, Mekong Lenta has high intensity economic growth and why undergoes increasing impact of climate. So we have to face with, um, climate, with, with climate impact and human impacts. The, then adaptation and mitigation measures are urgently needed for a sustainable land type. The study objective uh, is to provide the first um, mapping information of climate and human related risks impacting both the rice land, the rice the land street table for rice cultivation and the rice yield. And for that, we use observation uh, for the present in situ observation, uh, satellite observation, and we use modern based projection for the future. And the second is to derive possible options for adaptation and mitigation measures for uh, to the current problems and also a potential roadmap for natural solution. And um, the third um, objective is uh, to um, assess the national strategy versus uh, uh, what the, our options have. Uh, uh, next, please. Next. Okay, here is a, um, here is a summarize uh, what we learn about the impact of climate and human activity on rice area and rice yen. Uh, the first one is the salinity inclusion. The second one is the uh, flood extent and timing. Third one is the um, uh, projected submersion due to sea level rise and subsidence. And the last one is project rice yield and pro uh, production. So I take the first one here for the salinity inclusion. Uh, then the shaper have say in the, his uh, presentation. And here we combine the, the rice land in yellow uh, with the different scenario of climate and uh, human uh, activity. And here the red one is what happened for the rice land uh, if we continue to have uh, the um, um, the um, the um, okay okay we have to continue to to uh, extract the sand from the river. And the, um, okay, the first one then, the adaptation would be to reduce the uh, winter spring crop, uh, reduce the crop when the um, uh, salinity is high in the dry season. And also drought can also happen at that season. And also to advance the, the, this crop season to avoid the um, uh, occurrence of the salinity and conversion to other land use. And then the, the second one is um, interannual variability in flood extent and timing. Then we look at the flood since the last uh, four or five years, and we have seen that the big variability due to many things, uh, the, the flow of the Mekong, um, the extreme even um, precipitation, and also operation of the dams uh, upstream. And then the adaptation uh, could be the, to advance uh, the summer autumn rice season in the semi uh, region. So I explained the red one is the part of the rice in the midland region affected by early flood. And the upper region of uh, Angyang and Angyang and Dong Tap, they are protected by high dike. And so 
when the when the flood coming, they it's avoid the high dike um, region, but it impact the midland region. So the um, the um, the third one is a project submersion, like uh, the previous um, presentation have shown that um, if we continue to do the groundwater extraction and then uh, we have uh, to lost the, the red uh, area uh, of rice um, cultivation and we have to convert to other land use, aquaculture, mangrove, etc. And this, uh, the last one is the project rice um, yield production. If it's uh, just the uh, climate and then the yield will fluctuate just a few percent from four to uh, seven percent and and then but the, then it's a much less important than the loss of price land so the adaptation should be the change in crop calendar and change in uh, rice varieties next please next Okay, so so there's a mitigation, a lot of mitigation that we we have also uh, showed there, but then we when we com we compare with the um, um, strategy national strategy for rice here we show the um, resolution 120 about the increase in the quality rather than the volume of rice uh, and to diversify the rice based farming system and the um, the uh, national determined contribution um, for to adapt the rice control and practice, and uh, some of the decision to uh, adjust planting season, rice varieties, rotation rice, other land use. And so on of that, we agree with the adaptation, but then we commend uh, um, that only short term and local adaptation measures uh, have been considered. And the um, and also they are considered independently from the uh, key rice season. So what happened in upstream will not be uh, taken into account in, in the Midland region or coastal region. So the need to tackle the drivers of the negative uh, effect for, for mitigation uh, and the need for future projection with scenario of climate change and human impacts altogether. So then the some type of recommendation is consistent adaptation solution across time and space for short and long term for the wound and beyond, not uh, limited to a province or a ecosystem, um, regional ecosystem. So the, we need to understand the, um, the drivers which accentuated the climate effect for mitigation measures. So, and, and last but not least, for, for adaptation, mitigation, other factors, socioeconomic control, to be considered. So, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tui. Uh, so, the focus is uh, on impacts of the bilite dam on production system and ecosystem could not be presented today. So, we move on to the focus seven with Clara Julien, who is a PhD student in urban planning and geography, and she will talk of migration as an adaptation. Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie Noël, and thank you for the opportunity to present that focus. Um, this uh, focus is dedicated to the migration from the Mekong Delta, where the majority of population is involved in agriculture and where there is an out, very high out migration rate, towards Ho Chi Minh City, where there is a high in migration rate. So, next slide, please. So the question is to what extent can migration be considered as an adaptation strategy to environmental changes in the Mekong Delta? And that goes both ways. On what side, to what extent migration occurs in reaction to environmental changes? And on the other side, what are the impacts of migration on the vulnerability of migrants? So uh, this focus is based on the methodology implemented from 2019 to 2022. Uh, including a literature review and a multi-site fieldwork research conducted in two sites in Ho Chi Minh City and in several sites in the Mekong Delta in Ben Che Province and Sapcheng Province. So qualitative in-depth interviews were conducted with around 120 migrants, as well as farmers and local authorities. Next slide, please. 
So from the preliminary analysis, key results show that environmental changes are underlying factor in the migration decision, often masked by economic factors. That is to say that insufficient incomes from the agricultural sector and the lack of alternative job opportunities are expressed by migrants as the main reason to move. And this result is in line with previous research on the topic. Indeed, environmental hazards are rarely identified as migration factors by migrants themselves. However, they do impact livelihoods through their impact on farming. So the different disruptive factors are summarized on the schema on the right and the reduction of land availability, the economic changes and the environmental changes converge and sum up with social mutation, including uh, the promotion of urban lifestyle and the growing importance given to education and they all lead towards migration to urban areas. Next slide, please. So in that context, out migration from the Delta replaces or complements on-site adaptation strategies that are summarized on the right side of the schema. So that can include protective infra building of protective infrastructure, adapting food production and food processing, developing construction sector or the local industry, or moving within the Delta through migration or relocation. Migration outside the Mekong Delta happens as an alternative to adaptation within the Mekong Delta, but it can lead to multidimensional vulnerability in urban areas. That can be through job insecurity, precarious housing condition, social isolation, or the lack of public support, as we saw last year with COVID-19 pandemic impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, overall, migrants uh, move on a long, uh, do a long-term temporary move rather than a permanent one, and they intend to return to the land in the hometown. But how durable are those strategies given the land availability and the current environmental trends in the Mekong Delta? In addition, the environment is likely to play a growing role in migration decision. Therefore, it is more and more important to support the local population in the Delta through the development of local job opportunities and livelihood aids, especially targeting the landless farmers as they are most vulnerable. It is also important to communicate to population of the Delta on the medium and long term impact of climate change in order for them to make informed decisions, confronting the time frame of migration and the time frame of environmental change in the Delta. And finally, it is equally important to accompany migrants via dedicated public support structures to prevent them from entering urban poverty and to provide safe conditions for migrants uh, on multiple spatial and time scales. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Clara. So last but not least, we move on to the uh, Lucas Gem um, simulations. And I leave the floor to Kwang Chi Truong from Kanto University and RID. Uh, so we are quite late, so please uh, try to make it short. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marino. And uh, next, I would like to continue our presentation on uh, uh, for our work on developing the Luca Gem model for land use adaptation strategy in the Mekong River Delta. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, through our model, we would like to uh, simulate the land use adaptation strategy both for provincial and farmer uh, levels. So uh, we would like to uh, also to study. Uh, the interaction between provinces and farmer in the selection strategy under the impact of uh, economic and uh, environment changes, including uh, climate change, salinity, intrusion, and uh, land subsidence. Uh, the main idea of the model, uh, you can see in the, the diagram, uh, we, uh, in the model, we simulate land use changes under uh, impact of uh, climate change and uh, land subsidence. Uh, we can uh, identify the exposure area, and based on that information, the provinces can have adaptation strategy. And uh, for uh, farmers, they can have also individual uh, strategy based on the guidance of the uh, provincial change strategy. Next slide, please.
Yeah, in the model, we can see here there are two main type actor, Robinson's and farming units. And uh, for the Robinson's, they can choose adaptation strategy uh, for land use change in the Robin based on the information of a land subsidence, uh, the, the um, projected land subsidence scenario and the uh, arrow ecological zones. Uh, and the strategy of uh, Robinson's can be represented by a list of land use, land use type supported by the Robinson's. And it, it also uh, adapt to the national strategy for the arrow ecological zone based on the resolution 120, uh, dated in uh, 2017 of the government of Vietnam. Uh, for the farming unit side, uh, they can select uh, the land view every year based on their multi material evaluation, where land view, uh, land view uh, candidates uh, come from the list of the land view supported by the strategy of the Robinsons. And um, we can also uh, see, uh, evaluate, access the impact of climate change. Uh, in our model, we use the macroeconomic data from the GEM model. We use the economic, uh, macroeconomic variable to, for estimating the benefit and uh, the uh, investment budgets of activities. Next slide, please. Yeah, for exploring the, the adaptation strategies, uh, we define the four experiments. Uh, in the first experiment, we we consider that um, the in the case that the subsidence have no impact on uh, agricultural production. And the second uh, experiment, we analyze the case that subsidence impact benefit of uh, land use. And the third experiment. Uh, in the case that uh, there is only the individual adaptation of farmers and the four experiment is a set of uh, experiment we explore different cases that uh, provinces react a different level of uh, subsidence. Next slide, please. Yeah, based on our experiment in terms of uh, land use, until 2015, we found that in case that there are no impact of uh, subsidence and uh, subsidence, uh, the, the, the fruit tree area will be very high. Um, Inversely, uh, in the other, other experiment, the two ripe crop area will be selected and would be the dominant land yield in the region. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, besides with the, with the land use area, because in the first uh, experiment, we can see that the fruit tree uh, as, uh, will be selected. So the benefit of uh, people in the region will be very high also. But inversely, you can say uh, that the, the loss in case that impact uh, the land use are, will be impacted by land, climate change and uh, land subsidence, the loss it also very high. Next slide, please. Yeah, the results of uh, that the recession in early uh, response up to low level uh, subsidence in the, in the experiment four uh, bring many positive results in terms of uh, Vulnerable, vulnerable area, and uh, it could be uh, a good solution for in water resources management in the right season in the for the delta, and uh, it can uh, reduce the vulnerability area for from subsidence and uh, climate change. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.
Uh, so we're uh, quite running out of time, um, so I'm sorry for the, the limited time for questions. Uh, before we move on to questions, uh, just to, for you to note that all the GEM reports are freely available on the AFD's website. So uh, please, you can download them and read the full uh, report or chapters you're interested in. And as I said in introduction, a series of webinars will be organized next year to present each chapter uh, in full details. So now I will stop sharing my screen and we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. So there is, I don't know if people can ask question uh, directly or in the chat. Okay. Either so for for the audience, you can ask your questions in the uh, in the tab questions, or rather than in the chat if you can. Or I don't know if uh, people is it possible for people to raise a hand to ask a question uh, vocally. So everything was quite uh, clear. Here it is. Are there any questions in the chat here? OK, uh, so maybe if there is no questions from the audience, I guess maybe you were a bit overwhelmed by the, the different topics and presentation. I don't know if. Uh... OK, so we yeah, we can you can ask your question in the chat. So there's one from. Um, how circle economics plays a role in climate change and is it possible to apply this model in Vietnam? Uh, I confess I am not at all a specialist of the issue of circular economy, economics. Uh, I don't know if any of uh, the contributors uh, have elements on that. Yeah, Mark, please go, go ahead. Certainly applies to sand. Uh, because uh, that's one of the recommendations from the UNEP report. So uh, it's possible to recycle sand. You can recycle uh, sand uh, from old buildings and and, uh, and and reuse it. So it's uh, one dimension of, uh, of what I understand of circular economy. So that's uh, that's uh, at uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, Vietnam is very far from. Uh, uh, from efficient on there, although there's a le legal framework that uh, uh, invites uh, the sector to uh, towards more more recycling and more uh, more efforts in, in uh, recycling with uh, with some targets that could be more ambitious, but that uh, that are not yet met. And 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 the best of the class, if you want to have an idea, countries like Belgium or Netherlands are at between 20 and 30 percent of all the uses of sand for construction comes from uh, from recycling over thank you if i don't know if there are other questions from the audience what Huh. A tricky one. Uh, what is the key barrier planners face to improve the climate resilience of the communities in the Mekong Delta? Uh, it's a very broad, broad question that I think that concerns uh, about every topics we have uh, raised today. Uh, who wants to give elements first? Yeah, Nicola. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you very much for this question. Uh, actually, it's a very wide question, and I, I won't be able to answer properly to this wide question, but maybe it's interesting to reformulate it because the question is not only the climate resiliency, it's also how we adapt our economy to get it, uh, to, to get it, uh, 
to get it um, in good connection with, well, to, with, with what will be the 21th century. I mean that uh, the question in the Mekong Delta is not only climate change, is uh, an anthropogenic question. So you cannot just split it in two ways. And there is a strong connection. We saw it with subsidence activities, for instance. Subsidence is much higher because of human activities than climate change. Uh, it's even higher than sea level rise uh, due to external activities. The same for sand activities and the same for mangrove squeezing. So probably the, it's not a response, but it's more a way to reformulate the question in a way that can be irritable and uh, that can lead to some solutions. Maybe also to, to complement, I think that one, uh, if we look at the conclusion of the, um, so the first chapter of the Mekong report on the um, kind of discrepancy between current adaptation and development plans and what we know about the environmental issues in the Delta, uh, we, we concluded that the pressures are, are somewhat more or less acknowledged, they are identified, but when it comes to making strategies, development strategies, uh, in most cases, it's just as if the pressures were not, or at least not enough taken into account. Uh, so there is still probably uh, an issue like almost everywhere in, in the world, I guess, between short-term and long-term strategies. And as also Nicola showed it for the mangroves, uh, when you have a perspective of short-term gain, it's sometimes the, the first thing you do before considering the fact that it's not sustainable on the medium term to long term. Uh, so it's not, a, of course, it not, it's not a, a full answer, but uh, I think it's uh, probably part of the of the problem. Yeah, Mark. I can add from the sun perspective. So for until now, the key barrier was the understanding of the impact of sun mining. Uh, on, on the resilience, which is now covered in, 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 in uh, uh, very solid from a scientific perspective. Now the key barrier is to uh, monitor the results. Uh, if you cannot measure it, it's very difficult to manage it. So that's why we are developing set, uh, this uh, uh, sand budget to have an idea of, of what the results is, what are the replenishing rates and whatever, and, 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 then, and then you can do it. So monitoring uh, in, in uh, for the case of the uh, of the sun, monitoring is probably the, the key barrier at this stage, and, and hopefully we will uh, pass this barrier uh, in the coming months. Over. So we've got a question from Peter. Uh, what do we understand about the relationship between plans, policies on pay? Sorry, it's. Uh, but between plans, policies on paper, and those factors that shape environmentally relevant practice at local scales, particularly on the dimension of future discounting locality of scope. Um, <laughs> tricky one. Any anybody in the audience? In the I mean, in the in the in the moderators panel. Uh, I guess it's one of the questions that uh, we we did not have time to investigate in the in the first part, uh, as you uh, as you know. Uh, the <laughs> let's talk about governance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We in a, it's it's something that should be further in investigated because so far we have tried to uh, to to have a look at the. The, the the broad picture on uh, the, the the development plans at the Mekong Delta level or even at the national level, and we could not go uh, further to the local scales. And for instance, uh, for the issue of uh, groundwater extraction and subsidence, it's quite striking to see that the issue is not so does not appear uh, actually as an existential threat when you look at current Mekong Delta plans. But when you look at the legislation, uh, as Kai has shown it, there are actually plenty of different le legislations uh, with issue to, to have them to, to provide efficient uh, effects. But the issue of the link between groundwater and subsidence is, is acknowledged and taken into account. So I guess what happens at the 
what happens at the uh, Mekong scale or national scale and at the local scale, it's not always uh, consistent. And uh, it's something that, that should be further uh, further in investigated on how we it could be possible to have something uh, globally consistent uh, and included all the different issues that we 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 have uh, reviewed to re uh, that we have uh, reviewed to date, which is not so much an answer, but <laughs> the best I can I can say for now. Yeah, and Sepa. Yeah, I, I wanted to link a little bit between uh, uh, problem recognition, which in, in, in issues such as sand mining and groundwater extraction and salt intrusion. Um, uh, so problem is recognized by the government clearly, but um, in, 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 in an economy that's growing in a couple of percent, uh, percentages per year, um, and the significant demand for natural resources, uh, this understanding has not been translated into uh, directly into local um, common knowledge and no local awareness. That local awareness at the scale of communities, it's, it's perhaps missing to a certain extent. That, that in my opinion, it's a little bit of a, a, a gap between to, to, to translate uh, national uh, policies on the plan to environmental action in local and community um, uh, areas, and that that that's that has to do with day-to-day -day life and um, and the economic demands of the population and 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 the communities and uh, and their links to natural resources. Uh, it's it's an area that it's definitely uh, uh, worth exploring. Mark, you wanted to add something? Yes, yeah, sure. Again, from the sand. Uh, perspective, a key issue in Vietnam, like many other countries, is that uh, legislation is usually national, but the implementation and the uh, management uh, of uh, concessions is, is uh, at uh, local level and provincial level for the for Vietnam, and the capacity there is, is often a, a limitation. Uh, also, the uh, understanding that uh, the, the illegal sand mining is a small scale and, and uh, that's uh, and, and that the uh, the larger scale the concession hold, holders are not uh, are, are less but actually in fact first of all it it it, uh, it raises the issue of uh, right to the resource of, of local communities like any other resource it's well documented for forest uh, elsewhere but uh, and bush meat and, and other issues we can also discuss it for uh, explore it for for sand do the local communities have an ownership of, of the resource and that's actually one of the recommendations of the UNEP report, to be clear on ownership. Uh, but also the fact that uh, the uh, concession holders uh, in the current situation uh, are self-monitoring, self-reporting. So that obviously, again, not, uh, not only in Vietnam, in many other countries of the world, leads to uh, the tendency to uh, under-report and over-extract. So basically, the larger volumes uh, that are less regulated are probably uh, the result of, uh, of concession holders rather than uh, uh, people that are outside the uh, the legislative uh, borders. Yeah, over. Yeah, c'est Um Just wanted to add, and I also see this last question that also relates to this. Um, I think another. Uh, gap and challenge is uh, from policy to implementation as mark also mentioned implementation is local uh, it's also the the, the 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 political structure in vietnam that the provinces um, are basically responsible for the natural resources and their own planning and these provinces do not necessarily have to coordinate well with each other uh, which also results in sort of a fragmented approach towards a global, global, I mean, uh, regional, global at, at that level, uh, a fragmented approach towards uh, a global problem. So any attempt towards bringing these efforts together, uh, which I think it has to be done in the national level, of course, with um, uh, raising awareness in the, in the, in the local level, uh, can bridge that gap. And it's extremely important to towards a sustainable um, um, uh, adaptation strategy. Thank you very much. 
so we're we're running out of time. So um, I would like to thank again uh, everyone for their participation. Uh, thank the audience for being here and all the presenters. Uh, I, uh, we we will have opportunities to discuss more on your respective work uh, next year. It's always difficult to to present such a work in about four four five minutes. It's quite quite challenging. Uh, also, uh, before we leave, I would like also to acknowledge the work of my uh, colleague Etienne Espagne, who is not here today and who has now moved to the World Bank, but who was the leader of the project uh, during the, the past three years. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And I wish you a very nice day or end of day, depending on where you are. And I hope you will join uh, next year for the webinar series. And again, do not hesitate to uh, go for the full report online on the on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Goodbye.